hello everyone to the fireside chat. I'm sorry you didn't get to hear my amazing guitar playing, but another time. Um, so today we're going to go all the way to Borneo and Chan is going to take, tell us about his camp and I hope we'll all learn about this. And I, I have been to Borneo, but on the other side, so I think he's about a thousand, more than a thousand kilometers on the other side of the island from where I was. Um, but uh, I can tell you that it's really seriously impacted there by palm oil plantations. And some of the th things that I've learned about this are, are really quite challenging. Um, I'd also like to tell you that I'm in, in Mexico. This is a beautiful place, uh, Rancho La Puerta in Tacate, just across the border uh, when you come south from San Diego. And it's just a beautiful place, been here more than 40 years. It's similar, I guess, in, to Sekin in that. But today, of course, it's all Barneo, so I'm gonna turn it back to to uh, Aaron, who will then introduce the thing, and I'll be here with you the whole time. Thank you, John. So as we, um, to give you a little framework for how we organize our fireside chats, um, we'll ask you to hold your questions until after Chan's presentation. And we would love it if you asked your question in person by raising your hand, either on your video, and we'll try to capture you um, in the, the speaking order there or um, by raising your hand virtually on Zoom. The session will last about an hour and free feel, to, feel free to stay afterwards um, for an open discussion. Um, some quick updates about what's been going on at ecosystem restoration camps generally. Camp Acora in Australia is one of our partners who has been recently impacted by severe flooding in their region. They are safe, but the roads around them have been badly damaged and um, they've been experiencing landslides and trees down. Our partners at Camp Ch Ch Chokaya in Bolivia found a volunteer to start their baseline study for understanding the impacts of their restoration activities. And they will be collecting data in March and April. Um, at Camp Altiplano in Spain, they've been planting over 8,000 trees this winter, and by the end of March, they plan to reach 10,000 trees. We also want to send our congratulations to Camp Keti in India for satellite hosting the Fifth World Congress on Agroforestry. Some upcoming events um, that you might be interested in in a place near or far away from you. Um, we have several camp experiences coming up in March in Brazil, Mexico, and Uganda. Um, in April, our camp partner Green Pop is hosting a Reforest Fest, um, as well as our partners in France at Camp Mirsole will be having a camp experience in April. So if you have space on your agenda, and are able to visit one of them in person, it would be wonderful to have you there. And now without further ado, um, I will introduce Chan and um, we're very happy to have you here, Chan. I'm gonna make sure, please make sure you take off your um, mute so that we can hear you um, and we can see your video great. And then um, I will go ahead and advance your slides. Yes, should I start now? Yes, please go ahead. Basically, Camp Doku uh, was started based on the advocacy that we had uh, regarding bamboo and vertiva grass to mitigate climate change. This journey started in 1995 and uh, it proceeded to 1999 when we started a large scale uh, civic culture design of bamboo plantation to study 
uh, in depth, and this was a project sponsored by the government to recognize the challenges of climate change. You have the next slide. So in uh, 2020, we managed to secure a piece of strategic land. Uh, this piece of land that you are seeing now used to be a timber camp. It's a logging camp uh, about four decades ago, and it has been in disuse for more than three decades. And we were very fortunate during this time of crisis that uh, this piece of property came into the marketplace and we were fortunate to have secured it. The significance of this piece of land for us to develop Camp Doku is that uh, there is a small rainforest on these 10 acres of land, uh, which comprise about six acres. And of course, the four acres, which was uh, you know, depleted and uh, more or less uh, cleared, uh, we have uh, basically designed it using permaculture design to establish it into a camp setting, whereby there will be a food forest and um, also a kitchen garden uh, that will provide for the campers when they come here. So we're now in the process of uh, putting in the infrastructure. The beauty is that uh, on this piece of property, you can walk straight into a rainforest and you can experience a rainforest with all its biodiversity, with all its species of trees and uh, fauna, and of course, the extensive microbial life that live within the soil system. Uh, this is very unique for us because uh, it, you know, it is on a private property, a small private property, but it sits in a huge, huge land base where there are what we call wildlife reserve center, forestry reserve center, plus a lot of uh, degradation and destruction uh, for the land to be converted into use in terms of uh, plantation and uh, agriculture. So what we have been doing through this piece of land, uh, actually more than six years ago, we have been here advocating to the landowners to sign up a sustainability pledge to work towards restoration of this beautiful piece of rainforest that is basically uh, badly so-called chopped and cut. And so it's just like a, a man with a bad haircut, no? But you still get good, good sightings of all the beautiful rainforest. Next video. So these are, because of the deforestation, as you can see, uh, the places where it has been cleared, the land is already degraded and compacted. And what you have left is basically clay, hardened clay, and uh, no fertility. So if you look behind in this picture at the back, where the rainforest is, you see that uh, top 10 inches where the microbial life still exists. So on the, the side of where we have developed all this uh, water catchment area to basically uh, you know, the runoff from the mountain slope and also the collection of rainwater. Next slide. So our mission is to recharge ground water assets and uh, to basically create the uh, microclimate to restore degraded landscape and ecosystem. So the advocacy for us uh, is for the use bamboo and vertebral grass, which began in 1995. The bamboo that you see behind us is called Dendrocalamus giganteus. It was planted in our Forest Research Institute more than 100 years ago by a renowned botanist. It was planted by default. The botanist was in Burma uh, near the Indian border uh, collecting bamboo samples for 
um, documentation. He fell sick and had malaria and was rushed over to Malaya in those days to, to recuperate. While he was recuperating, he did most of the drawings uh, by hand of the species uh, of this Dendrocalamus gigantius. Alongside uh, the branches and uh, leaves and whatever he brought, he also brought some seed. So that seed was uh, discarded uh, into the backyard, which is where this bamboo is, uh, to be destroyed. But it survived. So this is a proof of evidence that a man planted bamboo uh, can survive over 100 years. Next slide. This is uh, a bamboo uh, grove, or rather a small uh, farm of about two acres, which I personally planted in the year 2007. And uh, this was a degraded uh, paddy field, uh, which was abandoned. And again, we were fortunate, my associate uh, was fortunate to purchase this land and then allow me to plant the bamboo. And uh, every bamboo that uh, was planted here was basically to understand uh, the different environment that it can survive and how to, uh, it can play a significant role in mitigating climate change by sequestering uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. So this species of bamboo is called Dendrocalosmus asper, planted in 2007. Uh, on another island in Malaysia uh, called Langkawi. Next slide. In 1999, since uh, 1995, um, when we when I came back to Malaysia, uh, we were a group of friends and myself. We were advocating uh, the government to look at the possibility on sustainability for our uh, palm oil plantation. And we were very fortunate that uh, the then Prime Minister agreed to this endeavor. And uh, this project was started by our Forest Research Institute in Malaysia, where we uh, look into the civic culture of designing uh, companion cropping and to study soil, to study the microclimate, water asset management, and also biological resources. So this project uh, was uh, embarked in 1999. We completed planting uh, in 2000, uh, just over 2000, near 2000, on not 300 acres of land in different sizes of plots. Uh, they were not in, uh, one single plot, but scattered all over a very large uh, palm oil plantation. So this picture was taken in the year uh, 2009, and uh, you can see the relationship between the companion cropping of the, the bamboo and also the health and productivity of the palm oil uh, that is not uh, be managed by using external inputs like chemical uh, inputs. So this is uh, one of the evidence that we had. But sadly, in the year 2010, uh, we were asked to remove this bamboo plantation because the degraded land that we work on turned into fertile land, which could be used for planting palm oil again. And uh, as a result of that, uh, a partner and friend of mine, both of us uh, purchased this bamboo plantation and we sadly removed this plantation. I mean, every bamboo that was living there, we duck it out and uh, we remove it and we send it to other parts of Malaysia to be replanted. Next. The beauty of planting bamboo with ecosystem, on the left here is an abandoned palm oil plantation uh, here on the island of Sarawak. 
and uh, in 2019 we planted this bamboo and as you can see uh, there was originally a small stream but there were no water flowing through it today you have a water system water asset uh, from the ground uh, flowing through this place next slide So the question is, uh, why did we choose bamboo or why vertebra grass? The, the beauty of bamboo from years of research and uh, hands-on uh, working in planting programs is that bamboo can establish microclimate very quickly. It, it is a fast-growing giant grass in that way, and it, it reaches to the sky and photosynthesis takes place. And, uh, it, within a matter of uh, as fast as eight to 10 months after planting. And the kerm will shoot out, though the first generation of kerm are quite small, they are about one inch in diameter, but they will rapidly uh, grow to its you know, required size. And it's able to create this uh, symbiotic relationship of photosynthesis, bringing down the necessary uh, so-called extradates and whatnot for the soil system. We also notice over the years that uh, when we work with land that is degraded, uh, when we plant bamboo, there are still a lot of land that is not under cover. And vertiver grass, which is a very ancient grass found in India and widely distributed now in Southeast Asia, is very fast growing. Uh, it's not an invasive grass because it does not produce any seed. So it has to be planted through uh, vegetative reproduction. And this grass has a lot of use and purpose in the sense that the root system of this grass can grow to three to five meter in length uh, on a vertical basis. And what it does is that it can recharge groundwater uh, very quickly as fast as uh, within three months after planting. So uh, when you have a land that is totally degraded and compacted and solid, it is not easy to grow any other crops. However, the vertiva grass, which is also drought resistant, uh, is able to survive without much nutrient. Next. This bamboo is uh, planted in a backyard here in the city of Kuching in a handicap center, uh, which has about half an acre of land. And uh, they invited us to come in. We have the program called the Power of Ten initiative. Uh, through this initiative, what we have been doing for a long time is we provide one free bamboo seedling to plant. And in return, after over a year, uh, we request for 10 bamboo seedlings uh, to be given back to the community. Now, we have not gone out to really advocate for people to plant bamboo on, on social media or in any other form of media. It has always been on the word of mouth basis. People have basically come to us after hearing what we have done, and we have uh, basically given them this species of bamboo called Bambusa bichiana uh, to basically allow them to have a hands-on experience with bamboo. Through this uh, program, our objective is to create a, a value system, a change in an outlook about ecological resources, uh, which nature has given to us. Rather than looking at it from a GDP standpoint about you know, how much money you can make, we look at what it can do in the lives of people to create a paradigm shift. So the growth of our community has been very slow, but very firm because uh, people who are interested in uh, making money fast will ultimately be very disappointed with us because we are not about making money, but we are about creating 
the value in the soil, creating the value in the lives of people around us. So the growth of our community has been slow, but very, very firm and very solid and very resolute in terms of our objective to mitigate climate change and to restore ecosystems. Next. The beauty of bamboo leaf, apart from microclimate, is that when you plant bamboo, which is a drought resistant crop, bamboo shed its leaves uh, twice a year. And uh, these leaves become organic matter, which are an important resource for the soil microbial life. And the first thing that you will notice after planting bamboo on the degraded land that is totally compacted or destroyed, uh, you will see that through the bamboo leaves, uh, it will create the first level of uh, return of microbial life. I mean, through our naked eyes, of course, you cannot see the microbial activity, uh, the fungi, the mycorrhiza. We cannot see this, but we can definitely see the arrival of earthworms. The earthworms are the first tier level so-called our partners in this uh, journey to rehabilitate degraded land and the ample supply of the uh, bamboo leaves uh, is basically food source for them. Next. So as you can see, uh, there's my finger pointing down to the soil. Uh, that soil uh, about three years ago was basically compacted and there's nothing to show about it. But uh, through the bamboo leaf, the microbial life has not returned. So on the left, uh, you see uh, bamboo that have been chopped off. Uh, due to the interest in bamboo planting, now in the year 2021 onwards. Uh, we have been expanding our nursery into larger areas. Uh, in this case, uh, this nursery is about 20 acres. So we have to fast track uh, rather than from the seedlings and from the uh, planting material, we basically uh, remove the bamboo clump and uh, split it up and then transport it immediately to the other side for replanting. Uh, this is because the demand for bamboo now is very high and planting material are quite limited, especially for this particular species called Bambusa bijana. Next. As you can see, uh, we are harvesting the bamboo from within the palm oil plantation. Uh, one of our greatest so-called uh, following of people involved in bamboo are people from the palm oil industries, uh, mainly smallholders. Most of these uh, smallholders uh, basically have seen the devastation. I mean, these are people who live with the rainforest and were so-called attracted to the economic uh, benefits you know, and they have uh, allowed their land to be deforested and then planted back uh, with palm oil. However, it does not seem that easy uh, because big plantations have all the resources to manage and to have efficiency, but smallholders do not have that kind of resources. And uh, more than two thirds of our palm oil plantations are actually in the hands of the smallholders. However, their acreage of production is not very productive. And as a result of them, uh, many of our members who have joined us in this journey of uh, so called uh, restoration of ecosystem started to try out and say, why not? Let's, let's see what it can do. And as a result of uh, planting the bamboo, they can see the soil change. They can see the result of what we have experienced when we did this uh, big 
large plantation system back in 1999. And as a result of that, uh, you know, they have uh, really so-called pull up their sleeves and got their hand dirty to be involved with us by producing enough planting material uh, to expand to more areas uh, in our country. Next. As you can see in this picture, uh, this particular plantation, uh, it's a smallholder plantation, it's not very big, but the area that they have uh, given to palm oil is 100,000 hectares. And, uh, but this particular section of this site is only about uh, in the region of 200 acres. So if you can see on the back, we are sitting at the boundary of the rainforest. Uh, these are primary rainforests with waterfalls and uh, ecosystem that are you know, unbelievable you know, to see. So past the next hill, you can see the, the, the mountain slope uh, is basically what we call, uh, it has been locked before. So this is a regrowth. You know? So you have a primary rainforest, you have a regrowth, and then you have palm oil. And in between all of this is the bamboo growing. And uh, now what is happening is that you can see through the soil uh, on the ground over here, the bamboo through the bamboo leaf have created this new microbial life. And uh, so we have a lot of uh, physical evidence of this nature whereby many of these smallholder plantation, which is now being, uh, is being evolved into a, not as a monocrop, but evolved into an agroforestry setting uh, with bamboo and also rainforest trees. Uh, because we are near to the rainforest, we are able to collect seeds of very uh, so-called endemic species of uh, trees, uh, which are now very rare. And uh, so this is what we have. Uh, been doing also. We also have a small nursery uh, with over 30,000 uh, rainforest tree species that we collect and we do our best to replant but because all our so-called members, uh, individuals, they are not big corporation. They are basically small families and so they do what they can do to basically help in the restoration program. Next. This is in Sabah. Um, prior to the pandemic, the community uh, of smallholders of uh, palm oil plantations heard about our work uh, in Sarawak and uh, about 30 of them flew over to visit us to see firsthand what is being done with bamboo. And fortunately, that was just before the pandemic started. And uh, after their return to Sabah, um, they organized themselves to basically expand the bamboo program. And sadly, uh, the borders were closed until now, and we have not been able to supply them uh, the quantities of uh, bamboo seedlings that they need. However, uh, we have resources of vertical grass in Sabah, and the program started uh, through the vertical grass planting within the palm oil plantations. Next. So basically, we basically consider vertical grass as a resource for below ground, and bamboo as a resource for above ground. So they complement each other and they can be planted closely together. Uh, th there are so many ways of uh, silviculture design of using the plant and their plant physiology to complement each other to basically restore soil health. Uh, our target always uh, has been when we enter any degraded area is to develop soil health with 
minimal cost with minimal uh, human uh, involvement, except to plant it and to allow both the vertebra and the bamboo to grow in a natural way. Next. Next slide. We have the next slide, please. I think we're on the left side, slide 10. Is that the one? Are you seeing the same one? Yeah. This is the final one. Uh, so basically, this is a picture taken in the year 2007. Uh, in the plantation, uh, which was uh, developed in 1999. It was at the time uh, I recovered from my stroke. I was bedridden for two years, and I went back to this plantation to negotiate uh, for you know, protecting it, to remain on this property as a showcase to the world uh, what has been done. But sadly, uh, that negotiation uh, went through until 2010, when uh, we have to uh, make the offer to purchase this plantation and to sadly remove it. It took us two years to dig out everything from the soil because the condition was that no bamboo should be sit, uh, sitting on the property. In fact, uh, they tried to remove this uh, in the period of four years uh, through many methods to destroy this bamboo plantation, but it was uh, not uh, successful because they did not understand the physiology of the bamboo and how to work uh, with it. Because the, the bamboo is a, a very, how do you call it? it? It's a very accommodating plant. You know? it, it is, uh, the only condition is don't try to harm it, uh, work with it, and it will work with you. So we were able to remove it in a very gentle manner and uh, to re replace them uh, all over the country again in different sites. So thank you for this short presentation. Thank you so much, Chan. And how interesting, I think, um, what you were mentioning about trying to work with what you have and not against it is a really important strategy for a lot of the restoration, the work that we're doing, whether it comes in the form of bamboo that doesn't want to be harmed um, or other plants that have already well established themselves in places. Um, so thanks for sharing that part. 